After the revolution 1911, Sun Yat-sen became the president of the Republican government in China. But despite the fact that uh, there was an end of Manchu rule and the formation of the republic, it was not possible for Sun Yat-sen to unify China, which he of course wanted. And in fact, China came to be divided into two parts, northern side under Yuan Shi Tai and a southern side under uh, Sun Yat-sen. And so Sun Yat-sen decided to resign in favor of Yuan Shi Kai, and that he did on 14 February 1912. Now, Sun Yat-sen gave certain reasons for this. One was that he wanted to unify China. Uh, he wanted to uh, restore peace throughout the country. And he also wanted to have uh, recognition by foreign powers, recognition for the new government. Now, these were some of the reasons which he gave. Yuan Shi Kai uh, became the president. He was uh, named a successor of Sun Yat-sen. But there were certain conditions. One was that Nanking should remain the capital, not Peking. The second was that Yuan Shi Kai should come to Nanking to assume provisional presidency. And the third one was that he should observe the provisional constitution to be drafted by the provisional parliament. On the next day, the body which provisionally elected uh, Yuan Shi Kai as uh, the president of the Republic of China, and the vice president was Li Yuan Hung. And after that, a delegation was sent uh, to Peking uh, on 18 February uh, 1912 to escort Yuan Shi Kai to Nanking. But the point is that uh, Yuan Shi Kai was in no mood to come to Nanking because Nanking was an area, revolutionaries were strong, and Peking was an area where he was strong and revolutionaries weak. And so he wanted to raise certain objections so that he would not have to come to Nanking. What he did was that he, ins he started instigating riots through his own men in Peking so that a situation emerges which would make it difficult for Yuan Shi Kai to leave Peking at that point of time. So that was the pretext which he himself took. And ultimately, uh, Sun Yat-sen and other leaders had no choice other than to allow uh, Yuan Shi Kai to inaugurate, to make the inauguration in Peking rather than in Nanking. And on the next day, Sun Yat-sen promulgated the provisional constitution of 56 articles, and which was the first of its kind in the history of China. And the first country to recognize the new government was the USA, followed by some other countries. Now, after the founding of the Republic, uh, under his presidency, uh, Yuan Shi Kai devoted attention to the building up of a military dictatorship in China. And he did not care to get any constitutional support for this. In fact, once he became elected, he went undo all the achievements of the revolution. Uh, first of all, uh, the cabinet was formed. The first cabinet was formed. In the first cabinet, important ministries, all the important ministries were under the control of Yuan Shi Kai's own men, uh, such as foreign affairs, internal affairs, war and navy. All these ministries went to his own men. And it was only the lesser ministries which were given to former members of the Tung Meng Hui, such as education, justice, uh, agriculture, forestry, uh, etc. Huang Singh was the choice of the revolutionaries for the Ministry of War. But he was made only a resident general uh, of Nanking. And as Yuan Shi Kai refused to pay uh, for his 50,000 troops, so Huang was ultimately forced to disband the army. The premier was Tang, Tang Shao Yi, uh, who wanted to lead the nation uh, towards the rule of law. But uh, since that attempt was in opposition to Yuan Shi Kai's policy or his attitude, so he was humiliated by Yuan Shi Kai and he was ultimately forced to resign. And the next premier was Lu Cheng Xiang who was totally ineffective and lacked direction, and that ultimately led to his impeachment by the parliament. 
Now, however, to the Southern revolutionary leaders, Iwan Shikai definitely displayed some outward reverence. Uh, when Sun Yat-sen arrived in uh, Peking uh, some time later, uh, he was cordially received and he was appointed director of the railways with full powers to formulate plan, plans of action. Now, it was in this way that they deceived the revolutionary leaders and he started on his, on his quest for the capture of dictatorial autocratic powers. Now, according to the uh, provisional constitution, a parliament was to be elected within six months of the formation of the government. And by then, uh, Tung Meng Hui had already been converted into Kuomintang by absorbing three splinter groups, of course, whose members were non-revolutionaries. Now, and this was the Nationalist Party. Kuomintang was a Nationalist Party. And against the Nationalist Party, there were other parties such as the Unification Party, Democratic Party, Republican Party. And in the elections that followed, the uh, Nationalist Party, uh, quite expectedly, uh, gained a landslide victory and they commanded more votes than the three other parties combined. Sung, a person named Sung Chiao Jin, who was a brain behind the Nationalist victory in the election, uh, he was the man from the side of the Nationalist Party to become the Prime Minister. Since he was very much critical of Iwan Shikai's policies, he was critical of Iwan Shikai's excesses. So, uh, first of all, Iwan Shikai wanted to bribe him, but when he failed, then he decided to assassinate him. It was on 20th March that he was shot. It was through, through these measures that Iwan Shikai endeared himself to the foreign powers, to the foreign imperialists. And that is, that is also the reason why the British, French, German, Russian and Japanese banks, they advanced uh, 25 million pounds to the Yuan government, Yuan Shikai government as loan. And the American press was all praise for Yuan Shikai. Yuan Shikai had already flouted the constitution himself. And the Republicans, uh, few Republicans who were there, were either exiled or assassinated. By then, Iwan Shikai assumed full power, and he, what he had in mind was to become the new next emperor of China. That was what that he had a deep longing for becoming the emperor of China, and he started taking steps in that direction. Uh, by the beginning of 1913, it was very clear that Iwan Shikai had already formed a dictatorship, and that. Uh, he had totally betrayed the republic, cause of the Chinese Republic. And so Sun Yat-sen uh, launched the Second Revolution, Second Revolution against Yuan Shri Kai. Uh, and he organized the army in the south. There were months of fighting between the two, uh, two groups, but uh, the revolutionary groups were, uh, revolutionary forces were weak. And that was one reason for their failure. Another reason was that the peasant question was not addressed, and so they could not enlist the support of the peasantry. Yuan Shikai came out victorious, and after gaining victory, he banned the Kuomintang or the Nationalist Party. Now, in fact, with the outbreak of the First World War, important changes started to take place. Now, Japan had allied herself with the uh, Allied powers in the war. And uh, there was only one battle fought between Germany and Japan, and that was fought in Shantung. And that was, uh, and there, uh, Japan came out victorious. Since it was a uh, warring situation, so Japan suddenly found herself to be in a position to colonize entire China. And so he be she became emboldened. And it was uh, on 18 January 1915 that the Japanese minister to China, Hiyoki Eki, uh, presented the infamous 21 demands to the Chinese government. 21 demands essentially meant the colonization of large parts of China by Japan. That was the essence. Yuan Shikai succumbed to that pressure. He had to uh, accept the demands. And that was followed by a public outcry, public discontent. 
uh, throughout the country, throughout China. And uh, there was a social ferment and intellectual revolution, intellectual movement, which ultimately culminated in the May 4th movement of 1990. Now, the irony was that uh, Yuan Shikai got little support from the divided and hostile European powers, as also Japan. He wanted to make himself the emperor of China on 1st January 1916, but the army was wavering. There was so much hatred towards Wan Shikai from the side of the people that he, he could uh, hardly uh, expect to get any public support at all. So uh, ultimately he had to retreat. Soon afterwards, he died in June 1916. C. P. Fitzgerald, uh, in his book *The Birth of Communist China*, has identified uh, three factors behind his failure. First was that Yuan Shikai's own character was very treacherous; it was totally untrustworthy. And in fact, Yuan Shikai had already thrice betrayed uh, those people who supported him. One, of course, was Emperor Kuang Su. Uh, who was imprisoned by the Empress Dowager Zhu Si. The second was a regent who recalled him to defend the Manchu dynasty and saw him betrayed. That was his second betrayal. And the third betrayal, of course, was the betraying the republic, republican form of government. That was the first reason. So his character, his totally untrustworthiness. The second was the hostility of the Japanese. Now, Japanese, in fact, provided money uh, for revolt uh, to be led by his own generals against him because there was a strong pro-Japanese section among the generals who ultimately became warlords and who are very much hostile uh, to Iwan Shikai. Now, Iwan Shikai was unaccept unacceptable to the Japanese because Japanese feared that Yuan might succeed. Now, Japanese felt that if that the, the thing which could save uh, China was an empire. And if Yuan Shikai could build up an empire and become an empire himself, then that would, of course, be detrimental to the interests of Japan. That is a reason for Japan's opposition uh, to Yuan Shikai. The third cause was, of course, uh, Yuan Shikai's uh, was a jealousy of his generals, jealousy of Yuan, Yuan Shikai's generals. Now, the generals ultimately realized that since the central power had become weak, they would become more powerful. The Yuan Shikai government had been totally discredited. So they could establish their authority in their own areas. So the forces on which he sought to depend uh, were no longer there. In fact, it was these forces which uh, ultimately helped in the rise of warlordism, in the rise of the warlords in China in the later period. Now, as a matter of fact, there were two important groups uh, within China at that time, military groups, all military groups. Uh, one group was in the Anhui province, and which was backed by Japanese imperialism. And there was another group, military group, which was backed by British and US imperialism in the Hopi province of China. And sometime later, there was the development of a third military group, a warlord group, which was again backed by the Japanese, and which was known as the Manchurian or uh, Feng Tian group. All these groups, they fought among themselves, they competed with one another, and to capture the central power in China. This period is known in the history of China as the age of the warlords. And uh, different imperialist powers supplied money and materials to these different groups, money, arms, other materials. Uh, and so they fought against one another. And uh, it was through those groups that imperial, imperialist powers penetrated. Among these military groups, the group that first captured political power in Peking was a Japanese-backed uh, uh, Anwei group led by Tuan Chi Jui. He was a warlord. 
and immediately after coming to power he took a loan from uh, from japan took a, a loan from japan amounting to 200 million yen which came to be known as the nishihara loan in august 1917 uh, just after the declaration of war against germany by the uh, usa uh, this group declared china to be the ally of the allied powers so china got herself herself involved in a war became a party in Ch in the chinese parliament there was much opposition to it and there was a public outcry against china's participation in the war now the age of the warlords made the situation practically unbearable in all parts of the country uh, particularly in the countryside there were greedy officials there were vagabonds in uniform there were soldiers with or without any pay without discipline and uh, they were allowed to uh, plunder the countryside rob the granaries without any state intervention and people naturally fled to the cities or to safe areas so throughout the period of the warlord rule from 1916 to 1925 and after uh, conditions steadily steadily deteriorated and little was known about the distress in the countryside uh, chinese revolution uh, to some people became uh, an incomprehensible confusion it was total utter confusion there were no principles and the japanese of course took advantage of this utter chaos in the countryside and to take firm steps uh, to make inroads further inroads into the country now despite all these dark features there were uh, at least two important uh, effects of the age of the warlords uh, one was that uh, it brought about the destruction of some of the important pillars of the old order the civil service the civil service uh, perished in this age and that was an age of total confusion uh, the older officials they withdrew they retired and new people who joined who turned to academics they were not at all interested in services of this type during that age also and that is the second one uh, the scholar class they withdrew from government service they were not interested in having government posts and they shifted to academics so there was a shift from the academics during this period and throughout the country there was banditry exploitation etc there were floods there were famines decline of inland trade etc so all this contributed to the ruin of the old order old order was totally destroyed during this period now after the death of one shikai uh, sun yat sen uh, returned uh, to china from abroad and he opposed china joining the first world war he said quite rightly that it was an imperialist war so china instead of fighting imperialism should not take part in a war that was fought among the imperialist countries and he established a new government in canton but uh, there was hardly any preparation so uh, this government also became short lived in 1921 there was a formation of the communist party of china and uh, sun yat sen was influenced also by the october revolution he was also influenced by the communist party of china and so he reformulated his three major principles of the people and also his three he formulated his three major policies since sunia sen was also anti feudal and anti imperialist at that point of time and the communist party's policy was also the same so there were common grounds for a, for the formation of a united front between the kuomintang and the communist party of china or the cpc so the first united front was formed 1924 to 27 and the main aim of the first united front was to fight in the northern warlords and to initiate the northern expedition this northern expedition was conducted by jointly by uh, the kuomintang and the uh, communist party of china and we have 
and we know that a Wampa military academy was formed. Uh, it was a military academy to train members in the art of war. Wampa military academy played an important role in, uh, in the formation of the Kwangtung Revolutionary Army for the Northern Expedition. Now, uh, within a few months, many provinces uh, came under the control of the revolutionary forces. It was very successful initially, and in fact, between July and December 1926, Hunan, Hupei, Fukien, Chekiang, Kiangxi, and Anhui fell to the revolutionaries. So the main forces of the northern warlords were crushed as a result of the northern expedition. And the situation became such that uh, there was a possibility that China might get unified within, uh, within a very short period of time. However, the national army uh, failed to remain unified. There was dissension within this revolutionary army. Sun Yat-sen died in 1925, and after him, uh, Chiang Kai-shek became the leader of the Kuomintang. Chiang Kai-shek adopted a totally different policy. And uh, a party which was revolutionary in the earlier period first became a reactionary party, and they then became converted into a fascist party. And what Chiang Kai-shek did was to occupy all the top posts, the posts of the commander-in-chief and other top posts, by his own men. And uh, those men came primarily from the feudal class as also the confederate bourgeois elements, so reactionary elements. And, uh, and this, this new leadership, the Chiang Kai-shek, was in no mood to fight the warlords because his enemy was, communists were the main, now became the main enemies of Chiang Kai-shek. And so he was more interested in fighting the communists than in fighting the warlords. And faced with such a situation, the CPC and some progress, the leftist elements within the Kuomintang, they carried on their movement, uh, defeated the warlord forces, and set up a revolutionary center at a place called uh, Wuhan. Now, meanwhile, the advance of the northern expeditionary forces was followed by an insurrection of the workers in Shanghai. Uh, and that was in February 1927. By then, the foreign powers took alarm. And in fact, in backed by foreign forces, it was in April 1927 that Chiang Kai-shek sent his troops against the, against the workers and the communists and killed thousands of them. Similar massacres were also done in Nanking, Canton, as also among the peasantry in the countryside. And in fact, that signaled the end of the uh, United Front and the Northern Expedition, that is the fight against the, uh, against the warlords. Sir, what was the speciality of the term warlords? Why were they called warlords? Warlords were feudal lords, no doubt, but they were, most of them were associated with military activities, uh, uh, generals, former generals. Uh, so uh, feudal lords, uh, taking part in war, possibly. These, uh, that is why they were called warlords. So they were very specific to China. Now we don't find them in any other parts of the world. At least by name. At least by name. Yeah, exactly. At least by name. At least by name. It, it is a peculiarity, no doubt mm. about it. And in fact, there was one uh, middle-sized or small warlord who, who became an important member of the Communist Party. That was Chu Te. Chu Te. He was a warlord, small warlord. And he was influenced by Mao, and he joined the Communist Party and later became the Commander-in-Chief of the Red Army. We have pointed out that Sun Yat-sen, after coming to power, abdicated in favor of Yuan Shikai uh, with the hope that that would unify China, but that did not unify China, and Yuan Shikai became a dictator, and he betrayed the revolution. So Sun Yat-sen initiated a second revolution. That was also a failure. Then a time came when central power became very, very weak, and so uh, centrifugal forces raised their heads, and that, uh, that constituted the necessary background of the age of the warlords. Uh, there were different groups, uh, one, uh, two groups uh, backed by the Japanese, and another group backed by the British and the 
uh, American capitalists. They helped them uh, to further their, their own interests. And then there was the formation of the first United Front between the Kuomintang and the CPC, uh, who fought against the Northern warlords. But that movement was not complete, totally complete, uh, because of the dissension, because of the betrayal of Chiang Kai-shek, who became the leader of the Kuomintang after the death of Sun Yat-sen. Uh, and uh, Kuomintang, under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek, adopted a policy which was diametrically opposite to the policy which was uh, adopted by Sun Yat-sen. It was very much anti-communist, more anti-communist than anti-foreign. So uh, it, it came to an end in 1927. And so with the, uh, uh, with the split in the United Front, the fight against the warlords, against the feudalism, against imperialism also came to an end, of course, for the time being.